Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Oncology Brothers. I'm Rohit Gosain, and along with my brother Rahul Gosain today, we have fascinating discussion planned out for you, which is around cardio-oncology. Though we have seen improvement in overall survival, when it comes to cancer, with our newer cancer treatment options, whether that's targeted therapy, antibody drug conjugates, or immune checkpoint inhibitors, this comes at a cost. Certainly part of it is financial toxicity, but rather also side effects that these newer agents have. Rohit, I have to agree. It's not just good enough for us to stop by saying that our patients have better survival or are living longer. It is important for us to acknowledge that some of these agents have lifelong side effects and these treatment modalities are not benign. And it's not just adromycin or trastuzumab, as you've pointed out, some of our newer agents can also have this long lasting cardiac side effects. So to focus on our patients receiving optimal cancer care while keeping their cardiac health in check, it is very important for us to keep this as a whole for our patients. To help us explore this topic of cardio-oncology, we're thrilled to have Dr. Susan Dent, a medical oncologist and president of the International Cardio-Oncology Society, join us today. Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. But personally, I'm also looking forward for you to be joining us here in person at the Wilmot Cancer Center in Rochester, New York. Thank you for inviting me. You know, I think this is such an important topic and really excited to discuss it today, especially after just coming back from ASCO and hearing about all the new therapies that we have that are really improving the clinical care of our patients. Indeed, Susan, this is certainly a very, very important topic to address. So just to get started, let's start off with the basics. What exactly is cardio-oncology and why has it become such an important discipline? It's a very good question. I think even today when I mention cardio-oncology to individuals, even those in the healthcare profession, they think this is focused on cardiac tumors or tumors of the heart. And that's not at all what cardio-oncology is all about. Cardio-oncology really looks at the intersection between cardiology and oncology, two professions that come together to look after the entire individual with cancer, right from the beginning when they start their cancer treatment through the entire treatment into after completion of their cancer therapy. And I can't stress that enough. It's the whole journey. And really, it's dedicated to ensure that our patients with cancer get the best possible cancer therapy without having a negative impact on their cardiovascular health. And that's so important as we see patients aging, we're seeing older people develop cancer, they may have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. How do we treat both? How do we get them through their cancer treatment? without worsening their cardiovascular health. And so it's that working together, I call it more of a person-centric approach than a disease-centric approach where we wanna treat the whole person, not just the mm-hmm. cancer. Indeed. Susan, thank you for laying that foundation. And you know, we all talk about survivorship, particularly we often state that we want our patients to thrive, not just survive. But let's be honest, that is not going to happen if their cardiovascular system is compromised. And you've set this perfectly. Let's cure cancer and save hearts. So Susan, let's start off with a broad topic and then we can start to narrow down a little. Can you highlight some of the key cardiovascular risks and toxicities that I need to be aware of as an oncologist? You know, we've known about anthracyclines for a long time and anthracyclines are still part of our treatment regimens that we use in breast and many other cancers. And we've known for many years that if we give a certain amount of lifetime exposure to anthracyclines, that can potentially lead to heart failure. A few things that are new about that topic, actually, we understand now that the dose, the total lifetime dose of anthracyclines is much lower than what used to think. So anything over 250 milligrams per meter squared, you really do have to start worrying about cardiotoxicity, which usually presents as drops in LVEF or heart failure in some cases. So that's something that's new. And then trastuzumab or HER2 target therapies came along a number of years ago. And when they were introduced for the treatment of early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, it really changed the landscape of how we approach that disease. And it led to significant gains in disease-free and overall survival. But we know that HER2 target therapies can also affect the heart and can cause drops in LVEF. And as we're being asked to do these echocardiograms, both in academic and community centers, 
you know, we were seeing drops in the left ventricular ejection fraction. And quite honestly, I don't think as oncologists, we really knew what to do with that. So the LVEFs would drop to low, the, below 50%. And then we would say, well, we better hold the therapy because that's what we're told to do. So that was really where my interest in this whole field began is I felt that this was a therapy that really improved the clinical outcomes for our patients. And okay, we've seen that they've had some form of cardiotoxicity. Can't we do something about this? What can we do so that our patients complete their therapy? And that's where I think cardio-oncology was really born, was this idea that we need to be able to provide the best cancer therapy for our patients, even in the setting of some compromised cardiovascular toxicity. And there's a new term for that, by the way. We call it permissive cardiotoxicity, meaning you can accept a little bit of toxicity if it's in the context of providing life care, sustaining or life curing therapy. Susan, thank you so much for touching on that. You've mentioned um, anti-HER2 therapy and breast cancer. That field is also shifting fast because now it's not only breast cancer that I have to worry about when it comes to anti-HER2 agents. We have a bucket approval for something like trastuzumab durexatecan. So this field is not just between breast medical oncologists or cardio um, oncology, but as a community who's giving TDXD, this should be on our radar. Drugs like osimertinib uh, that we tend to use in lung cancer, they have cardiac side effects. So all this is very important for us to keep in mind when treating our patients. You're right. Originally, it was very focused on uh, on breast cancer, but now, as you can see from here, that there are many, many uh, cardiovascular toxicities associated with different classes of drugs. So, you know, we we've seen tyrosine kinase inhibitors and and their impact in terms of hypertension. We see some of our drugs lead to increased risk of thrombosis. We have you know, PF3 kinase inhibitors that can cause a me metabolic syndrome that can be detrimental. And we can't forget about things like radiation. So when you introduce radiation into the field, it can also cause cardiovascular toxicity. So most people think of chest radiation or left-sided radiation and the impact of it on the structures of the heart, which can appear years down the road in terms of coronary artery disease or valvular heart disease. But even if you have radiation to other parts of your body, in the in the abdominal area, you're affecting the vascular system and that can lead to potentially hypertension. So many different mechanisms of toxicity in across many classes of drugs. And as we're moving away from traditional chemotherapy drugs and more targeted drugs, each one of those new target drugs seems to carry with it a unique cardiovascular toxicity. Right. Can't stress the importance of that, especially when in past, as you stressed that we only had to worry about trastuzumab and anthracycline. So we still have to worry about that today. But along with that, a very common class that we tend to rely on uh, in a lot of cases is immune checkpoint inhibitor. As a community oncologist, we very well need to be educated from this aspect. Now, have you seen less cases of cardiac toxicity with this? Wonder if that is partly because we don't know how to diagnose the cardiac toxicity being contributed from immune checkpoint inhibitor, but we have seen cases like myocarditis, which leads to mortality, which is very concerning. Susan, to me, it seems collaboration between oncology and cardiology is critical. Can you build on this a little? I'm curious to see how, and basically as a community oncologist, I should be collaborating with my cardiac colleagues so we can provide better care to our patients. Right. That's very true. And I think there are different time points where that collaboration is very important. So I would say, you know, we need to think about collaborating with our cardiology colleagues right at the very beginning when patients are starting their cancer therapy. And I would advocate that as oncologists, we need to think about risk assessment right at the beginning. So you have a patient coming to you who might be exposed to immune checkpoint inhibitor. What are their underlying risk factors? And can we determine, are they at low, moderate, or very high risk? of experiencing cardiovascular toxicity. So we're very fortunate that the European Society of Cardiology came out with these cardio oncology guidelines in 2022. And it really speaks to trying to think about how we can determine risk. And as you can see here, and they have um, endorsed these performa that are used in several different classes of drugs that help us determine what that risk is. And then, of course, during the course of their therapy, patients may run into issues such as hypertension or drops in EF. And that's another time point where it's important to collaborate and then well into survivorship. 
So I think that collaboration, it really needs to start at the very beginning. And not that you need to refer every single patient to a cardio-oncologist, but for instance, if you have someone who's at high or very high risk of experiencing cardiovascular toxicity, that is the person probably you want to speak to a cardio-oncologist earlier rather than later. The low-risk people can go ahead and, you know, you treat them only if something develops down the line should you then, I think, entertain reaching out to your colleagues. From a community oncology standpoint, would you say that one needs cardiac clearance before we start in any immunotherapy or uh, chemotherapy? And also, if one is on immunotherapy, would you say getting serial troponin or getting troponins beforehand or anything from practical aspect of it? Yeah, there are. I would say that, you know, I would refer you to the these guidelines, which actually outlines exactly what they recommend okay. as baseline tests for immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, as you alluded to, uh, things such as myocarditis, it does happen. It's not common. Right. It happens in about one to two percent of patients with cancer. It's more common in cancer patients who are getting dual in immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so, for instance, in renal cell. So we're not we don't see it as commonly in in things like breast cancer, where we're just giving one. Um, but it, in this guideline, it actually outlines what they recommend in terms of baseline investigations and importantly, how you can follow those patients while they're on therapy. And, you know, as you can see on this diagram, I want to point out that there are some level one recommendations around how we manage people, how we assess them for risk. But a lot of this is based on expert opinion because we still don't have the data. We still need to do clinical research and we need to understand better how to manage these. But for now, this is the best information that we have. So this is my one plug for research in this area. I think we need to have, need to have a better understanding of how to manage or well, actually, you know, determine who's at risk and how to manage. And another area that's very interesting in this space is we're now looking at prevention strategies. So once you've identified that person who's at high or very high risk, can you prevent them from developing cardiovascular toxicity? And so um, now there are some studies that are ongoing looking at different agents, the traditional beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, but importantly, statins. There's a lot of interest in that. And SGLT2 inhibitors, really promising data, looking at the potential benefit, even in non-diabetics, of preventing cardiovascular toxicity. So it's a real exciting area. We don't know the, a lot of the answers yet, but I believe that we should be more proactive in trying to prevent these things rather than reactive as oncologists and waiting till they get into trouble and then consulting our cardiology colleagues. Isn't the future looks exciting, but bringing it back to my clinic. So I have a patient, I'm hypervigilant. These patients are going for their um, screening echocardiogram. The way the EF is being reported, the modalities are also changing. So a patient in front of me, stable EF, but the cardiologist also reported GLS. What am I making out of that? So let's say if the EF is preserved, but the GLS continues to go up and down in my clinical settings, do I need to change my practice based on that? Any um, opinion on day in, day out, what I need to worry about in my clinic with this? And so Absolutely. sorry, Susan, before you start, uh, if you could define GLS for our audience as well, please. Of course, fair question. So GLS stands for Global Longitudinal Strain. And essentially, it is thought to be a more sensitive indicator of LV dysfunction. So GLS really looks at the difference between um, diastole and systole in the heart, and you get a number, let's say a number of minus 18. So minus 18 meaning the difference between those two, um, the diastole and systole. And what happens is as the left ventricular becomes more dysfunctional, that number drops because you're not getting the same difference. You're not getting the same pumping action. So you, sh however, you should never make a clinical decision based on GLS changes alone. This is an early indicator that your patient might be getting into trouble. And so my feeling is if you see a difference or a change of about 15% is the current standard, that's an early sign for you that maybe you should contact your cardiologist or cardio-oncologist that this patient might be getting in trouble. So often you see the GLS drop, but then the before the LVEF. So I have reached out to my sort of cardiology oncology colleagues and I've advocated that I would like them to put a line in that echo report saying if this then this to help, you know, oncologists, because I don't expect them to understand what that means, but it's actually being advocated uh, for all the echoes that are being done now. 
I really appreciate that because day in, day out, like I said, this is something we see in our clinic very frequently. Susan, looking ahead, any particular major research priorities and initiatives happening in cardio-oncology that we should have it on our radar? Yeah, thank you uh, for asking that. So this is my my sort of thoughts around how we should approach cancer patients and their care in 2024. I think it's no longer adequate just to see a patient and say you should get you know drug X or you should be treated with this radiation that we need to think about the whole person. So what I would say for oncologists, both in the community and academic centers, look at your whole patient, assess them at the beginning, look at their risk factors, try and see if you can determine whether they're at low or high risk. Then they can start their therapy, hopefully in good shape. If they develop problems, reach out early to a cardio-oncologist. And importantly, we have to also think about lifestyle as our patients are going through the treatment. So advocate for exercise, smoking sensation, lowering of their BMI. Where research is really going in this area, as I alluded to earlier, is looking at what we call primary prevention strategies. They, of course, are looking at better drugs to try and deal with cardiovascular toxicity. And then the third area that's really been under-researched is after completion of your cancer therapy into survivorship. You know, we discharge these people from our practices, and then we hear five years down the road that they've developed heart failure. We need to find a way to actively monitor these patients that are high risk and intervene much earlier. So it's that whole, once you know, once you're diagnosed with cancer, you're automatically a cancer survivor. We have to put as much intensity and interest in not just treating their cancer, but what happens to them after they finish that into survivorship. This has been incredibly insightful. Thank you so much, Susan, for going over this very important topic. And it is important for our listeners to know, as you stress, that we need to treat the person as a whole. As a result, please, please, please tie in the cardiac uh, colleagues much sooner before it gets too late. As you cited, that preventative measure is more important than reactive. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast. Oh, you're most welcome. Today, we had a chance to discuss the important topic of cardio-oncology with Dr. Susan Dent, a president of the International Cardio-Oncology Society and a medical oncologist at Duke University. Not only do anthracyclines or anti her therapies have cardiac side effects, but we have to be mindful of this with immune checkpoint inhibitors, anti-EGFR, and the newer class antibody drug conjugates. Being proactive in your approach in collaborating with your cardiology colleagues is critical so that our patients are not only surviving, but also thriving. Monitoring their cardiac function with echocardiogram and keeping newer tools such as global longitudinal strain is extremely important. As Dr. Dent stated previously, let's make sure that we are curing cancers, but also saving hearts. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for more practice-changing and informing discussions. We are the Oncology Brothers.